So imagine you wake up one morning, make your coffee, sit down at your computer, and discover that all your files have been replaced with a single message that oh basically my says, God. Hey, your stuff is locked. Pay us $300 in Bitcoin and maybe we'll give it back. Maybe. Your family photos? Locked. Your half-finished novel about a guy who's really good at fantasy football? Locked. That embarrassing folder you swear is just tax documents? Super locked. This isn't a Black Mirror episode. This actually happened to about 300,000 computers across 150 countries in a single weekend back in 2017. Welcome to the story of WannaCry, possibly the most successful cyber attack you've actually heard of, which, let's be honest, is a low bar because most of us can't name three cyber attacks. Actually, don't try. You'll just end up Googling famous hacks and falling down a Wikipedia rabbit hole about Anonymous. So in this video, we're going to casually explain what WannaCry was, how it managed to basically take over the internet for a weekend, like that one friend who shows up uninvited to every party, and most importantly, how you can avoid being the next victim of something like this. We'll cover what ransomware actually is, beyond just bad computer thing. The full WannaCry story, which honestly reads like a thriller written by someone who barely understands computers. How it technically huh? worked, explained in a way that won't require a computer science degree. Why hospitals, shipping companies, and even government agencies got absolutely destroyed. And finally, some actually useful advice for staying safe that doesn't involve living off the grid in a cabin. Because here's the thing, WannaCry wasn't some ultra-sophisticated, Mission Impossible level hack. It was more like someone realizing that half the world leaves their front door unlocked and just walking in. So let's talk about how that happened. Okay, first, what even is ransomware? Think of it like this. You come home one day and someone has changed all the locks on your house. They didn't steal anything. They didn't crash the place. They just made it so you can't get in. Then they leave you a note saying, Venmo me $500 and I'll give you the new keys. That's basically ransomware. Except instead of your house, it's your computer. And instead of, of physically changing locks, they scramble all your files using encryption. Now, encryption itself isn't bad. Encryption is actually great. It's how we keep our passwords and credit card info safe online. It's essentially taking your data and scrambling it with a secret code so that only someone with the right key can unscramble it. The problem is when the bad guys encrypt your stuff and they're the only ones with the key. So ransomware works like this. You accidentally download some malicious software. Maybe you clicked a sketchy email attachment or visited a compromised website. That software runs, oh encrypts all your important files, and then displays a message demanding payment, usually in Bitcoin because criminals also hate talking to banks. And here's the genius, evil part. They usually demand an amount that's annoying but not devastating, like $300 to $500, because they know that if you're a regular person who just lost all your photos from your wedding or your small business financial records, you might actually pay it just to make the problem go away. It's like a parking ticket, except the parking enforcement is a North Korean hacker collective, which is definitely not something I thought I'd say today. The WannaCry story. So now that we understand what ransomware is, let's talk about WannaCry specifically. And honestly, this story has everything. Government spy tools, accidental heroes, and institutional IT departments that apparently thought update your software was more of a suggestion than a requirement. It all started on May 12, 2017, a Friday. Because of course it was a Friday. Nothing bad ever happens on a Monday when people are actually paying attention. The attack started spreading around 7 a.m. UTC, and within hours, it had infected computers in over 150 countries. And we're not talking about random home computers. We're talking about hospitals, universities, shipping companies, railways, and government agencies. The NHS in the UK, you know, the National Health Service, the thing keeping British people alive, got absolutely hammered. Hospitals had to turn away patients. Ambulances were redirected. Doctors couldn't access patient records. Surgeries were canceled. Imagine calling in sick to work and your doctor's office being like, sorry, we're also sick. Digitally, 
FedEx got hit. Telefonica in Spain. It was like the digital equivalent of that scene in disaster movies, where they show different countries all experiencing the same catastrophe, except instead of meteors, it was outdated Windows XP machines. Now, here's where it gets interesting. The attack was spreading so fast that researchers were freaking out. Cybersecurity experts were basically watching in real time as this thing bounced from network to network like the world's worst game of digital ping pong. Enter Marcus Hutchins, a 22-year-old British cybersecurity researcher who at the time was basically just a guy who was really good at analyzing malware in his spare time. He's examining the WannaCry code and notices something weird. It's trying to connect to a specific domain name that doesn't exist. Uh? The domain was something like iuqerfsodp9ifjapostfjhgosurifjhgosuirijfewerweergwea.com, which, yes, is a real domain that someone clearly just keyboard smashed. Hutchins realizes this might be a kill switch, a way for the attackers to stop the malware if needed. So what does he do? He registers the domain. Cost him like $10. And just like that, the attack stops spreading. Turns out, the malware was coded to check if that domain existed, and if it did, to stop encrypting files. Why? Probably as a way for the attackers to stop it if things got too hot or maybe to avoid getting caught in sandbox analysis environments that automatically register any domain's malware tries to contact. Either way, a $10 domain registration basically saved the internet for the weekend, which is somehow both incredibly lucky and incredibly concerning, because it means this whole thing could have been way worse. Now, you might be thinking, okay, but who did this? Who was behind WannaCry? Great question. The answer, according to multiple governments and cybersecurity firms, is North Korea. Specifically, a hacking group called the Lazarus Group, which is basically North Korea's state-sponsored cybercrime division. And before you ask, yes, the same North Korea that struggles with consistent electricity access somehow has one of the most effective hacking operations in the world. Geopolitics are weird. The belief is that North Korea was trying to make money. They demand ransoms in Bitcoin, which is harder to trace. And given that the country is under constant international sanctions, cybercrime is actually one of their more reliable income sources. Which is a sentence that should probably concern us more than it does. Okay, so how did WannaCry actually work? Let's get a tiny bit technical, but I promise we'll keep it simple. WannaCry exploited a vulnerability in Windows called Eternal Blue. And yes, that name sounds like a rejected Final Fantasy villain, but it's actually way scarier because it was real. Eternal Blue was originally developed by the NSA. You know, the friendly folks who definitely aren't listening to this video right now, as a tool for spying. Basically, it was a way to break into Windows computers remotely without the user knowing. Your tax dollars at work, America. But here's where things get spicy. In early 2017, a hacking group called the Shadow Brokers leaked a bunch of NSA hacking tools, including Eternal Blue, just out into the wild for anyone to use. It's like if the government developed a skeleton key that opens every lock in the country, kept it secret, and then someone stole it and posted the design on Reddit. So North Korea took this leaked NSA tool called Eternal Blue and weaponized it into WannaCry. Here's how it worked. Eternal Blue exploited how Windows computers talk to each other. Once WannaCry got onto one computer, it automatically spread to every other vulnerable computer on the network. No clicking required. It just hopped from machine to machine. Then it encrypted all your files, deleted backups, and demanded $300 in Bitcoin. The ransom note said, Oops, your files have been encrypted. With a little sad face. Points for friendliness, I guess? So what happened when WannaCry hit? The UK's NHS canceled 19,000 appointments, doctors used pen and paper, FedEx lost $300 million, Renault and Nissan shut down production. And here's the kicker. Microsoft had released a patch two months earlier. Every infected organization was running outdated software. Total damage? Over a billion dollars. The attackers made about 140,000. Why does this matter now? Because it's still happening. 
Colonial Pipeline paid $4.4 million in 2021. JBS Foods paid $11 million. MGM Resorts lost over $100 million in 2023. People still don't update their software. Here's how to stay safe. 1. Update your software. Enable automatic updates. 2. Back up your data. 3 copies, 2 types of media, 1 off-site. Disconnect external drives when not in use. 3. Don't click suspicious links. Watch for weird sender addresses and unexpected attachments. 4. Use antivirus software. Windows Defender works fine. 5. Be careful on public Wi-Fi. Use a VPN for sensitive stuff. 6. Use strong passwords with a password manager. Enable two-factor authentication. Most cyber attacks succeed because of human error. Don't be that person. To recap, WannaCry caused billions in damage in 2017 because organizations didn't update their software. It was stopped by a 22-year-old registering a $10 domain. The lessons are still relevant because ransomware hasn't stopped. It's just gotten more expensive. The good news? Basic precautions dramatically reduce your risk. So go check for updates. Or don't. I'm not your IT department. Stay safe out there.